It is uh, good to see all of you here this morning. It's great to be back in the Bay Area. Uh, it's certainly good to be among friends. As Lou mentioned, I spent several years across the Bay at the University of California at Berkeley in the economics department, a home of such illustrious scholars as Laura Tyson, uh, President Clinton's uh, first he uh, head of his Council of Economic Advisors and now a special economic uh, policy assistant, whatever that may uh, entail. Uh, it certainly was kind of the, uh, being behind enemy lines is the feeling that I had. Uh, people would sometimes ask me, well, were there any uh, conservatives in your department at Berkeley? And I had to respond, well, yes, there was one conservative fellow. Um, the only problem was he was a, uh, a native of communist China, so to be a conservative to him meant he thought that the crackdown at Tiananmen Square had been a little bit too soft. So that was the kind of conservatism uh, gives you something about the range of opinion that existed in the economics department there. Um, among my teachers uh, were several economists who have now gone on to become bureaucrats. Some of you may have seen an article in the Wall Street Journal a few months ago about the Berkeley Economics Department where uh, – the article was praising the fact that so many members of the department have gone on to service, quote unquote, in Washington. Uh, apparently, the, that's the measure these days of a, of a quality economics department is how many of its members can go on and become uh, uh, members of various uh, agencies uh, in our nation's capital. <clears throat> uh, and among my teachers uh, was Richard Gilbert, who is now the uh, chief economist at the Antitrust Division of the Department of Justice, where he toils at uh, tasks such as trying to stop that great menace to American civilization, the Microsoft Corporation. Uh, another fellow named Michael Katz, who is the chief economist at the Federal Communications Commission. And um, maybe at, at the end, uh, during the question period, we might talk a little bit about things like this new telecommunications bill that was just passed on Thursday and the issue of censorship in electronic communications and censorship uh, uh, especially in the case of the Internet. Uh, I, noticed, I know that some of you were uh, present at the most recent John Randolph Club meeting here in, uh, just down in the, on the peninsula, and I uh, spoke there about the issue of uh, Internet censorship and a little bit about the history of the Internet, and I uh, certainly would be happy to talk about that some more for those who are, uh, who are interested. M my, just to make one brief comment uh, right now, I have kind of mixed feelings about this question of whether uh, these uh, decency laws and so on to limit, quote, obscene speech uh, on the Internet uh, have some justification. But I just want to note that the one fear that many people have is that once we have uh, decided that it's okay to, uh, to, to limit, uh, you know, obscene or offensive material uh, to be communicated over these media, uh, that will only be the first thing to go. The next will be uh, other forms of offensive speech and offensive text and pictures, which of course will in would include uh, all the various hate crimes that are so defined today. So of course most of the things that any of us in this room would like to say may end up being banned on the, uh, on the internet as well. Just to give you one recent example, uh, there's a, uh, a bulletin board or an electronic uh, mailing list on the internet supposed to be devoted to Austrian economics. In fact, it's dominated by a group of uh, slightly wacko uh, uh, theoreticians who call, call themselves Austrian economists. And there was a very interesting comment last week where someone made the charge, one of these people made the charge that uh, those of us uh, who are opposed to central banking and, oppo and indeed opposed to fractional reserve banking uh, are, are tr really motivated not by scholarly concerns but by anti-Semitism, that it's a hatred of the Jewish merchant banking elite that motivated people like Murray Rothbard uh, in his critique of fractional reserve banking. <laughs> so clearly, if those people were in charge, uh, there would be no discussions on the Internet or anywhere else uh, about uh, the problems of the fractional reserve system. Indeed, many of the issues that, that, that we're here to talk about this weekend. But I, but I do just want to say thank you to all of you here who helped make it possible for me to survive those, those dark years. And it really is true that uh, among the many roles that the Mises Institute plays, uh, giving support to uh, students, graduate students, young professors such as myself is really a crucial 
It's a very crucial role, not only uh, financial support, but also moral support, uh, um, intellectual ammunition, and so on. You, you can only, I can't tell you what it is like to be in a place like that day in and day out, and then get to come for a weekend to a Mises Institute conference, or get to come for a week to the Mises University in the summer and spend a whole week with other Austrian economists, free market intellectuals. It's just, it really is uh, not just a breath of fresh air, it's almost a whole sort of intellectual uh, rebirth that gets the juices flowing, gets you charged up, makes you want to go back and finish the work that you're doing, uh, complete your degree, write uh, articles, whatever it is, uh, whatever you're up to. Um, so that really is that really is crucial, and I don't think I would have been able to do it um, had it not been for the support of people like, like yourselves. W what I want to talk about this morning is the road to prosperity, the road to prosperity. And in, in fact, I could make this a very short speech, some of you, which some of you might prefer, um, and just give you a short answer that, I mean, it's very simple. The road to prosperity uh, depends on uh, the L word, okay, the great L word, and I don't mean liberal. Of course, I mean liberty. Liberty is the key to prosperity, the key to progress, and uh, what, what what we really need to have prosperity in the United States is a political system that promotes the traditional Lockean virtues uh, of the right to life, liberty, and property, and not life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, as, uh, as Jefferson mistakenly inserted it uh, into our founding documents, but life, liberty, and property. So the uh, uh, freedom, in a sense, especially the freedom to own property, to write contracts, uh, freedom to associate with whomever we please, those are, that's, that's the easy answer. That's the short answer. That's, uh, uh, the, that's the means by which we can achieve uh, our goal. Let me, what I want to talk to you is give you a longer answer and talk a little bit uh, this morning about um, some strategies that we might use, talk a little bit about strategies that other free market thinkers uh, have advocated. And I especially want to talk, talk to you about this because strategy was a great passion of Murray Rothbard. Um, he, he lamented often that whereas those on the left, especially, especially the traditional Marxists, spent lots and lots and lots of time thinking about how to actually bring the revolution about. In fact, he said the Marxists spent about 10% of their time developing the theory and 90% of their time uh, planning how they would do it, how they would take over. Whereas free market intellectuals or libertarians or paleoconservatives uh, with them, the proportions have been almost the reverse. Uh, we spend 90% of our time thinking about uh, developing our doctrine uh, and only about 10% of our time thinking about how we would actually put these kinds of reforms into place. And something that, uh, that uh, Murray Rothbard cared about quite, a, quite a, a lot and something that we here at the Mises Institute are thinking about actively is this question of tactics, means, Given what we want to accomplish, how is it that we're going to be able to do it, given the current political realities? And I want to get us, uh, start to get us thinking a little bit about some of these issues. I know that other speakers uh, throughout the day will, will go into uh, greater detail on these. Let me begin by talking to you a little bit about uh, the, uh, the classic book uh, uh, that is evoked by the title of my talk today, and that's uh, the book by Friedrich Hayek, The Road to Serfdom published in 1944. And uh, Hayek, of course, was uh, uh, one of the most eminent of the modern Austrian economists. He was a, a student, an indirect student, younger colleague, and in, in many ways a disciple of Ludwig von Mises. Uh, Hayek, of course, won the Nobel Prize in economics in 1974 and helped to give uh, some legitimacy to the Austrian school right at the start of the so-called Austrian revival when modern Austrian economics was coming back, back into play. Um, incidentally, uh, it, the relationship between Hayek and Mises is very important because Hayek says that uh, as a young man, he, along with many other uh, of his, uh, others of his generation who had just been through the First World War were mild socialists. Hayek says he was a socialist of the Fabian variety along with his other colleagues at the University of Vienna in the 1920s. And it was only after reading Mises' book, Socialism, in 1922 that Hayek came to see the error of his ways. Hayek and many other prominent men of his generation, uh, such as Gottfried Hobbler, a uh, great uh, economist and scholar, 
in Europe and at Harvard and an associate of the, the Mises Institute, uh, Hobbler was also converted to the free market to laissez-faire by reading Mises' book, Socialism. And so something that uh, we're all very conscious of is the fact that we need to always be on the lookout for more potential Hayek's. Okay, part of our educational strategy is to make sure that bright young people uh, who might be interested in free market ideas will get exposed to them and will have a chance to to convert from uh, from their their uh, whatever it is that, that that they currently believe. So Hayek uh, published The Road to Serfdom first in Britain and then later in the United States right around the end of World War II, and it was a very controversial book. Uh, Hayek's main point was that uh, the kind of central planning that had already begun to be implemented in Britain and, of course, was uh, being undertaken in the United States as well as part of the war, that this central planning was leading us down the road to serfdom, okay, that it would bring not prosperity but the opposite of that. In short, Hayek was trying to show that uh, all forms of collectivism and not just uh, fascism of the, of the German or Italian varieties uh, would lead us down the same road to tyranny, okay, the same road that, our, uh, that the Axis powers had taken, uh, that we were, that in a sense, Britain and the United States were headed down that same road, that by imposing sort of what were considered mild uh, uh, collectivist measures to assist in the war, and of course in Britain the road, uh, the, the socialist measures had already been introduced, Hayek tried to argue that those were the wrong tactics. Those tactics would lead us down the same road uh, that uh, Germany, Italy, and Russia had, had taken. The, it, it was, it, the book caused quite a sensation, um, mostly among, uh, the, in, in, uh, among lay readers, not so much among the intellectuals to whom Hayek thought he was addressing his thesis. Um, he made some very other... Uh, uh, very uh, some other important and interesting points in that book, and I do recommend that you that you look at the road to serfdom. Uh, he, in one place, attacked the spurious distinction between so-called positive liberty and negative liberty. This is the uh, what you get in the political science textbooks today. That well, of course, the the kind of thing that we're interested in, true liberty, genuine freedom. Well, that's that's just one kind of liberty. That's a limited notion of liberty. That's negative liberty, meaning the freedom uh, not to be interfered with, which of, is, of course, what liberty means, right? The, the right to do what you want to do without uh, restriction from the state. Uh, th this is defined as only a, a limited kind of liberty. There's also so-called positive liberty, and that's the, the liberty to have things, right? The freedom, freedom from want, freedom from need, freedom from hunger, uh, the right to a decent job, the right to housing. So on. So the, the whole notion of freedom, liberty, freedom and liberty, has been completely corrupted in in, in modern day usage. Uh, here, here's uh, how Hayek says it in the Road to Serfdom. Hayek notes that uh, quote: "To make a totalitarian system function efficiently, it is not enough that everybody should be forced to work for the ends selected by those in control. It is essential that the people should come to regard these ends as their own. This is brought about by propaganda." and by complete control of all sources of information. The most effective way of making people accept the validity of the values they are to serve is to persuade them that these are really the same as those they have always held. And the most efficient technique to this end is to use the old words but change their meaning. Few traits, it goes on, few traits of totalitarian, re totalitarian regimes uh, are at the same time so confusing to the superficial observer and yet so characteristic of the whole intellectual climate as this complete perversion of language. And he's talking about this misuse of the term liberty. Uh, and of course we see this around us all the time uh, today. For example, <clears throat> uh, the word racist, which used to refer to hatred towards a particular race, now refers to uh, you know, any opposition to the welfare state. Uh, um, uh, Restaurants that don't serve all customers in exactly the way those uh, customers demand to be served, as Lou explained last night in the Denny's case. Hayek continues, the worst sufferer in this respect is the word liberty. It is a word used freely in totalitarian states as elsewhere. Indeed, it could almost be said that wherever liberty as we know it has been destroyed, this has been done in the name of some new freedom promised to the people. 
Even among us, and Hayek's writing in the 1940s, even among us we have planners who promise us uh, collective freedom, quote unquote, which is as misleading as anything said by totalitarian politicians. Collective freedom is not the freedom of the members of society, but the unlimited freedom of the planner to do with society what he pleases. And these are important words to keep in mind when we hear uh, uh, politicians and their media uh, flunkies talk about uh, the new, new eras of liberty and freedom that people like Bill Clinton are going to, are going to usher in. Okay, they're talking about, they're, they're taking our words and using them to mean their opposite. Thus to completely confuse and, and uh, 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 things and sort of muddy the waters. And that's, that's a conscious strategy on their part. Now, incidentally, what happened to Hayek for writing this book? Hayek was, uh, was ostracized and outcast in the intellectual community among economists. And Hayek had already by this time achieved a great reputation as a skilled technical Economist, he was working out the details of Mises' theory of the business cycle, and he had won uh, great acclaim for that. But but after writing *The Road to Serfdom*, Hayek was dismissed by the intellectuals as being a mere a mere polemicist, a mere, a mere uh, a polemicist uh, journalist, and not a real serious scholar for having written a popular book. Now, now, what were Hayek's ideas about strategy? How to bring about uh, uh, how to bring about freedom, genuine freedom, in an era of uh, great totalitarian sentiment. Well, Hayek did have a, a, a consciously articulated strategy, and Hayek's strategy was uh, that what you need to do is convert the intellectuals. You need to persuade uh, fellow academics and top-level scholars, philosophers, that the free market, that laissez-faire, is the is the proper creed. And Hayek believed that people, that intellectual opponents of laissez-faire, that prominent socialists, ac socialist academics, w were not motivated by any uh, malice or ill will, but were merely misinformed about the facts. They just didn't understand. They were well-intentioned. They thought that their policies would bring about uh, uh, prosperity, but, but they just didn't understand uh, how, the, how markets really work, what the real consequences would be. And if you could get all these great minds together, uh, you could persuade the socialists, persuade the socialists that the free market was the right way to go. In fact, the road to serfdom, if you notice, is dedicated to, quote, the socialists of all parties, close quote. And Hayek didn't mean that to be facetious. He really believed, or claims he, he believed, that socialists would read this book and would be converted, would realize the error of their ways. Okay, um, so Hayek's strategy was first to con convert or convince the intellectuals, and the, the top intellectuals would then go on to convert the people that Hayek called, in a wonderful phrase, the second-hand dealers in ideas, by which he meant journalists, teachers, writers, uh, the clergy, etc., the people who, uh, where, where uh, the average person uh, gets uh, most of his ideas about these kinds of issues. And so what Hayek did to bring this about uh, was to found an organization called the Mont Pelerin Society, which you've probably heard of. It was founded in 1947 with the first ever meeting of a group of like, these uh, like-minded intellectuals uh, from all over the world, uh, right at the first in this, in this period. Now, uh, why did Hayek feel like an organization like the Mont Pelerin Society would be necessary? Well, uh, partly he, he wanted to uh, he, he wanted to do this because the role of the economist, of the intellectual, but especially the economist, had changed dramatically during the war. The, the traditional role of economists has been to uh, to say no to what the state says. Okay, when the king says, "Ah, I'm going to tax the people. I'm going to le levy heavy taxes on the people. That'll bring great uh, bring great prosperity to me." The economist says, "No, you don't understand. That's not going to work. That's going to cripple uh, production. Is going to ruin the economy. Uh, will devastate de devastate the land." No, you can't do that. That's not going to work. No, you can't have more guns and more butter at the same time. No, you, this policy is not going to work. This policy is going to have an adverse effect, and so on. That's historically what the role of the economist has been. In World War II, that role was completely corrupted. What happened in World War II was this uh, strange phenomenon of all the economists going to Washington. 
Okay, which we now see culminated in uh, things like the, what we were talking about earlier about the Berkeley Economics Department. Okay, in World War II, the economists en masse headed off to Washington to work for various government agencies, to do statistical work, uh, to assist in procurement uh, and uh, uh, wartime planning. Okay, and this included not just uh, people like John Kenneth Galbraith, who was head of the Office of Price Administration, whose job was to impose price controls during wartime. I don't mean just people like Galbraith, uh, also people like Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman worked for the Treasury Department during World War II to come up with new ways of raising revenue to support the war, okay? uh, including uh, Friedman was the, was the one who came up with the idea of the withholding tax. Okay? And uh, by the way, so some of us at the Mises Institute have been accused from time to time of, of Friedman bashing. Okay, and I don't. And, and I, I certainly, to Friedman's credit, he admits now that 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 was a mistake. That having a uh, that a payroll tax, uh, automatic deductions during peacetime are certainly not a good idea. Although he doesn't acknowledge uh, any knowledge of that during uh, during the, during the war when he uh, imposed this as a temporary expediency. Those of you who have read uh, Robert Higgs's great book, Crisis and Leviathan, uh, know that H Higgs's main thesis is that the way big government expands is through this kind of ratchet effect, that there's, always, there's some kind of crisis, like war, for example, for which temporary emergency powers must be claimed. Well, of course, we're not going to impose totalitarianism, but just for the duration of the war, we need to have these price controls, we need to raise additional revenues, we need a payroll tax, et cetera, et cetera. But then, of course, once the war is over, we never go back to the way it was before the war. The temporary measures always remain, uh, sometimes not in exactly the same form. They're disguised a little bit, but in essence, they remain. And so we ratchet upwards towards statism during the crisis and never really fall back very much once the crisis is over. We just wait till the next crisis when we ratchet up uh, one, one more time. So anyway, so Hayek uh, founds this society more or less as a debating group, okay, where the ideas, the, the, the ideas uh, of liberty would be worked out and would then be disseminated to uh, the second-hand dealers of ideas and then on to the general, the general populace. Uh, and, and Hayek did assemble a very impressive group of scholars for the first meeting uh, of, of this group, which met uh, at Mont Pelerin in Switzerland from from which they got the decided to call themselves the Mont Pelerin Society. And present at that first meeting included people like Mises, uh, Henry Hazlitt, uh, Hayek, of course, uh, Wilhelm Rupke and Fritz Machlup, uh, notable Austrian economists, uh, Leonard Reed, who, uh, the founder of the Foundation for Economic Education, and also some Chicago school economists like Friedman, uh, George Stigler, and Frank Knight. And in, among the specifics of Hayek's plan for this kind of group uh, were uh, the following, that it should, be, uh, it should com be composed mainly of economists, but also of scholars from other disciplines. In other words, economics is key, but economics is not the only thing. Okay? You also need uh, political theorists, legal scholars, historians, philosophers, etc., as Hayek said, a political philosophy can never be based exclusively on economics or expressed mainly in economic terms. Okay, because as we all know, economics, economics is certainly uh, very interesting to all of us here in this room. Okay, but to the man on the street, economics is, well, they might want to talk about it for a few minutes, but after, but they'll, they quickly get tired of it and want to move on to something else. Okay, so it's, it's sometimes hard to get people motivated and stirred up into, uh, 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 to action merely by talk, talk of, uh, merely by couching things in economic terms. So we need more of an interdisciplinary approach. Okay, and I'm going to come back to that in just a few minutes. History is, is, was particularly important according to Hayek, right? Because those who write the history books have a disproportionate influence on the minds of the next generation. Can we have some great historians associated with the Mises Institute? And that's very key because where, where do people get most of their ideas? Uh, these things like the, the distinction between positive and negative liberty, well, they learned it in school. They learned it from their textbooks and from their teachers in school and have never thought to question the, uh, these kinds of things. Okay? Hayek also believed that uh, the group should include some journalists 
Okay, not to officially record the proceedings, but because you needed to have some members of that profession uh, involved in uh, dis- these, these kinds of discussions because they would, could have a great influence uh, on the people for, for an obvious reason. Now, one example of a success that came from this Hayekian strategy uh, is the case of Ludwig Erhard, who became the, um, became the Minister of Economic Affairs for West Germany uh, at the end of the war and l- later became Chancellor in the 60s. Ludwig Erhard was himself a member of the Montpelerin Society, and his two main economic advisors were uh, Wilhelm Rupke, who was a founder, along with Hayek, of the Montpelerin Society, and uh, another scholar named, German scholar named uh, Walter Eucken. And what Erhard did, his first major act on assuming his post as uh, essentially Minister of Finance, was to, uh, fr- to remove all price and wage controls, Say, to, to completely deregulate prices and wages. Uh, the result was a spectacular post-war recovery in West Germany, okay, where, uh, the, the result of which West Germany is one of the great uh, 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 prosperous economies of, of the day. And it's interesting to note what the mainstream economists' reaction at the time was to uh, uh, Erhard's proposal this decision to deregulate prices and wages, to remove the wartime price controls. You can only imagine what the mainstream economists thought about this. Uh, John Kenneth Galbraith, for example, to pick an easy target, said in 1948, there has never been the slightest possibility of getting German recovery by the wholesale repeal of controls and regulations. Okay. Uh, Walter Heller, another prominent economist who became uh, jo- uh, John F. Kennedy's the head of Kennedy's Council of Economic Advisors, uh, said a couple years later, quote, the positive use of fiscal and monetary measures which he supports, in other words, intervention, is to be sure not in harmony with the orthodox free market policies espoused by the current administration of the West German Federal Republic. Okay, so he wanted to make it clear that he did not support any of this free market stuff that was going on in Germany. Okay. Now, what's the situation today among economists when asked about these kinds of issues. Well, um, things have changed. Things have certainly changed for the better, but we still have a very long way to go. And what I mean by that is uh, most of us thought that the collapse of socialism and the the, the fall of the Berlin Wall uh, in in 89 and then the collapse of the Soviet Union would prove to be the final irrefutable evidence that Mises was right in his prediction back in the 1920s that socialism couldn't work, that a socialist economy was just not possible. And Austrians have been arguing over the years that uh, uh, developing Mises' position, showing how, uh, this, how, uh, showing how Mises uh, would be right, and then finally, in one glorious moment, the whole thing fell down and Mises was, was demonstrated to have been correct by the evidence. Okay? And you would think that would be enough to convince everybody. But, of course, it hasn't. Of course, it hasn't. Um, and this is especially true among academic economists. Here's what these people say. Uh, there are very few sort of outright explicit, explicit Marxists or socialists uh, among the economics profession today. Okay? Everybody says, well, yeah, of course, of course, sure, we know that socialism didn't work. Uh, pure socialism didn't work. Uh, you need to have markets in some form or some fashion. Uh, you can't completely uh, have central planning from the top down. But so, so markets, are, markets are good, but markets are good only in moderation. Okay? Capitalism is okay only if it's just a little bit of capitalism, not a lot. Okay? Uh, free markets, c- c- markets are good, markets are better than central planning, but only if there's a strong central government to perform, to pr- uh, perform essential functions, such as uh, targeting strategic industries, uh, maintaining infrastructure, especially investments in quote-unquote human capital, which means state-run education. Of course, regulation of monopolies, uh, the establishment of a strong central bank to assure macroeconomic stability, the wonderful glories that we've experienced here in the United States. Um, these things have to be in place for markets to, to be okay, according to the, uh, the, the academic economists, the mainstream economists today. 
these things have to be in place for markets to, to be okay, according to the, uh, the, the academic economists, the mainstream economists today. Okay. And again, I want to read you some quotes from some prominent mainstream economists. And I'm not going to pick on people like Galbraith, okay? Uh, there, although it would be easy to dig up a lot of quotes that would make you chuckle from people like Paul Samuelson uh, and Galbraith and others saying things even up to, you know, 1988 about the glories of the Soviet system and how the, the uh, Soviet Union was soon going to eclipse uh, the Western economies and its GNP and so on. I, I mean, it's... It, it's too easy to go after those people, okay? It's not enough of a challenge. It's not any fun. Uh, instead, let, let me quote from uh, three uh, very prestigious economists, uh, younger economists working today. All, all of these have won what's called the, 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 the Clark Medal, which is an award that's given out to the, 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 the best economist under the age of 40. It's, this is supposed to be kind of the, uh, the first thing that you win before you go on to win a Nobel Prize in your 60s or 70s. Um, one of these is Lawrence Summers. Lawrence Summers uh, is a, was an a economist at Harvard, one of the youngest people ever to get tenure in the economics department at Harvard. Um, incidentally, he had a very distinguished, distinguished pedigree, uh, being Paul Samuelson's nephew. Um, he then became uh, a bureaucrat, was the chief economist at the World Bank, uh, later uh, the, the uh, Treasury uh, Secretary for International Affairs. And I'm just, I want to quote him from some remarks he made in a World Bank publication in 1993 on the issue of economic development and the transition towards a market economy in the former socialist countries. Okay, this is a, a, a hot issue, of course. And th these comments that I made earlier about markets being okay in moderation applies especially to these uh, situations to those countries. This is where all the big shot Harvard economists are going over to uh, Eastern Europe and uh, Russia and the former Soviet republics to uh, be advisors and consultants and to tell them how to plan the, tr the transition. Slowly, you don't want to go too fast, you don't want to rush things. Gradually try to impose a little bit of uh, liberty, a little bit of economic freedom uh, in these formerly planned societies. Here's what Summers has to say on the subject. Uh, he says, uh, market development itself requires government action. Okay. The socialist economies in transition from Eastern Europe to East Asia are finding out that the establishment of the rules, for the rules of the game by the government is crucial to the success of market reforms. And by the way, by rules of the game, he doesn't mean uh, establishing the rule of law okay, or having strict enforcement of property rights. He means things like this. Uh, the need for government action goes further, its rationale resting on various notions of market failure. Investment in human capital uh, and physical infrastructure by the government are usually justified because of externalities or spillover effects in the consumption or production of uh, both of these categories and the inadequate incentives for markets to take them into account. In the case of primary education, for example, there are consumption-related spillovers. We might talk a little bit later about what these people mean by spillovers. Uh, the benefits to liter literacy go well beyond the gains to the individuals becoming uh, literate. In the case of physical infrastructure, such as roads, there are production-related externalities. I'll come back to externalities in a minute. Uh, based on the need to make lumpy investments, by which he means big investments, like, you know, the Hoover Dam, uh, uh, or to integrate the service in large networks. Uh, negative spillovers, too, justify government intervention. Environmental pollution and congestion are inadequately accounted for by the market. And of course, he doesn't go into the property rights solutions for things like uh, environmental pollution that have been discussed by, uh, by, by market economists. So Summers winds up, the central issue then is one of the state and the market, but it is not a question of intervention versus laissez-faire, a popular dichotomy but a false one. Uh, as he goes on to show, uh, it is rather a question of the proper division of responsibilities between the two and of efficiency in their respective functions. Okay, So these people are not outright explicit socialists saying we need to nationalize everything. No, they want to allow markets to work a little bit, but only in the presence of the, only if the strong hand of the state is there to correct market failure, uh, to provide things that the markets are uh, not providing. Uh, another another notable economist is Paul Krugman, who's currently at, formerly a uh, professor at MIT and now at Stanford. 
and a specialist in uh, international trade and uh, development. And Krugman said uh, a little earlier, uh, well, last year in, in the fall of 95, uh, talking about uh, the kinds of things that we talk about, the, the crushing burden of the welfare state. Krugman tr is uh, trying to argue that the welfare state is really not that bad. Okay. He says, quote, the great myth of American politics is that the middle class is groaning under the burden of huge taxes deployed to support the undeserving poor. In fact, what the welfare state really does is to take from the well-off a little and give to the poor, also a little, but because they are so poor, it matters a lot. Families in the middle are not much affected either way. Okay? And I think Lou gave us plenty of uh, st some statistics, plenty of evidence last night for how people in the middle sure as heck are affected. We can go on to talk about that later. Uh, Krugman goes on with a sort of a, a, a bizarre quote about uh, social welfare programs are really just insurance. They're not transfers. They're just insurance. And that's, uh, a, that should be, the, that's the, the best justification for them. And he's surprised that uh, he doesn't see that in the, uh, that justification discussed much in the literature. I mean, of course, if, if all it is is insurance, then why doesn't private insurance handle that? Why do we need, uh, why do we need state insurance uh, to take care of those problems? Let me just read you one more quote, which I think you'll find amusing, if not completely incomprehensible, uh, by Joseph Stiglitz, who's currently the, head, the current head of the Council of Economic Advisors. And Stiglitz is a, a, a very big, big, big shot. Okay, in, in the mainstream academy, uh, he's sort of the closest thing to uh, uh, Paul Samuelson of today, except for the fact that whereas Samuelson's textbook became a bestseller, and a lot of it, most of you who had an economics course in college, most likely you had the Samuelson book. Uh, Stiglitz wrote a Principles of Economics textbook that was an abysmal flop, um, probably because it was written in a style similar to this quote that I'm about to read you. Uh, this is again from a World Bank report in '93. Uh, now, bear with me now. Stiglitz says, The standard theories of the efficiency of competitive markets are based on the premise that there is perfect information, or more precisely, that the information held by individuals or firms is not affected by what they observe in the market and cannot be altered by any action they can undertake, including acquiring more information. Okay. By the way, that's certainly not the Austrian justification for market competition. This is Stiglitz's view of the only way you could possibly justify competition. Thus, the fundamental theorems of welfare economics, which assert that every competitive equilibrium is Pareto efficient, provide no guidance with respect to the question of whether uh, markets such as financial markets, which are essentially concerned with the production, processing, dis dissemination, and utilization of information, are efficient. On the contrary, economies with imperfect information or incomplete markets are in general not constrained Pareto efficient, and he has a citation to one of his own learned papers on the subject as proof, uh, there are feasible government, government interventions that can make all individuals better off. Thus, thus, not only is there no presumption that competitive markets are efficient, but there is a presumption that they are inefficient. Moreover, even with no other barriers to entry, in the presence of costly information, there is a presumption that markets will not, in general, be fully competitive. This strengthens the presumption that markets, in the absence of government intervention, are not constrained Pareto efficient. Okay? And thus, obviously, the government has to step in to correct those failures to bring about Pareto efficiency. And, of course, Austrians completely reject uh, the mainstream notions of uh, welfare theory uh, from uh, economics, general equilibrium, and the concept of Pareto optimality. And, I mean, this is the reason why Austrian economics is so important. And why it's very important that we continue to develop the Austrian school uh, and uh, encourage uh, young scholars to, to become uh, to, to read the Austrian literature, to get students to be exposed to these ideas, and not just the ideas of a Stiglitz. Okay, people like Stiglitz are the ones who are writing the textbooks. Okay, that's what uh, the current generation of college students, that's what they're getting in most of their economics courses, unless they're fortunate enough to have uh, one of the speakers uh, at this conference or a Mises Institute adjunct scholar as their professor. Um, this is the kind of stuff that they're getting. Okay, I, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, some some of the popular examples of market failure that are in the academic economics literature today. Okay, what, uh, what people like uh, Stiglitz mean by market failure. Um, one of these is a, a subject that's called path dependence. Excuse me, path dependence. Um, 
This is an example. Uh, oh, path dependence is the idea that has become very trendy lately among economists, that uh, certain outcomes are sort of historically determined in the sense that, in, 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 for example, in the choice of technologies, uh, the choice of uh, uh, establishing a standard, a technical standard, like for video cassettes, the VHS standard versus Sony's Betamax standard. Okay, the claim is made that the market will sometimes choose the wrong standard, the less efficient standard, and we get locked into that. Okay, because a standard, by, by definition, only works when everybody else is on the same standard. So when we have technologies that have what these economists call a network externality, a network externality, it's possible for the market to choose the wrong standard and we get locked into it. The, the famous example of this was the example of the typewriter keyboard, the so-called QWERTY keyboard, uh, named after the letters in the, in the, in the first row. Uh, there was a very influential article by a Stanford economist named Paul David claiming that, uh, talking a little bit about the history of the QWERTY keyboard, and some of you some of you, I'm sure, know this, that the, the original layout, the sort of standard layout that we have today, um, had to do with the uh, arrangement of keys, that in the old-fashioned typewriters with keys, uh, designers put the, they tried to put letters, the, the most frequently typed letters, uh, evenly spaced apart on the keyboard so the keys wouldn't, would, would jam less frequently. And according to Paul David, uh, this is an inferior, uh, alignment. this is not the most efficient way to put the keys. Uh, he claimed that there was a, that there is a there are some rival keyboard arrangements, uh, one called the Dvor Dvorak keyboard, uh, which put the keys in a different place and, and which are much more efficient. People can type much much faster uh, with the Dvorak keyboard. But because uh, the market chose the QWERTY standard as the standard, now we're all locked in. We can't switch over to a new typewriter, a new keyboard layout because everybody was trained to type with the QWERTY layout. And of course now with computers and so on, it doesn't matter. There's nothing about the, key, the keys jamming that makes any difference. And economists have picked up this QWERTY story like you would not believe. Okay, and now we're they're all looking out there around us to try to find more QWERTYs, examples of bad technologies, inefficient, inferior technologies that the market has locked us into. And of course what they propose as an alternative is that the government sets standards for these kinds of things. That whenever there's a new technology, like the computer, for example, that a group of experts, government experts, get together and decide, well, this is the arrangement of keyboard that, of the keyboard that everybody has to use okay, to make sure that the right standard is selected. Uh, uh, the VHS beta example is another good one. The problem is all these examples, upon closer inspection, turn out to be wrong. They turn out to be false. For example, the QWERTY story is all wrong. Uh, or, or what's wrong, the, the, Paul David's claim that there existed a rival keyboard, this Dvorak keyboard, that worked better. That claim, the evidence for that claim turned out to be based only on a report by Dvorak himself. Mr. Dvorak claimed that his own keyboard allowed people to type much faster. Okay, and in fact, studies, people who went back and looked at the historical record and found studies, an Air Force study uh, at the time, which showed that it, the, really, any arrangement of the keys is just as good as any other once you learn it. Okay, the, it's just repetition that matters, and it doesn't. It, it really doesn't matter where you put the keys, as long as you learn to type on a particular keyboard and you stick to it. They all, you know, typing speeds all kind of converge at about the same amount, no matter what keyboard arrangement you use. Okay, so there's no evidence that there's anything wrong with the QWERTY standard. Okay, there's also no evidence that the Betamax technology was really better than the VHS technology, even though uh, we're, now we're stuck with VHS. In fact, they worked just as well, and VHS was cheaper at the time, which is why the market selected it. Uh, an another example, of course, is with Microsoft. This is the big bugaboo of the network externality path dependence guys today. They claim that Microsoft, the Microsoft sort of standard for uh, its operating system, is not a good standard. Okay, the MS-DOS and Microsoft's Windows are far inferior to other technologies like the Macintosh operating system and ones provided by other manufacturers. Yet Microsoft has 85% of the PC market. So everybody is stuck with using Microsoft products, Microsoft's operating system, even though it's really not as good as uh, uh, rival operating systems. Again, this claim turns out 
upon closer inspection to be, uh, to, can, we can easily dismiss it as being false. There's no evidence that from an economic perspective, as opposed to a purely technical perspective, uh, that Microsoft's operating system is any worse than any other. Okay. Uh, there, let me briefly mention one other uh, example of a, a market failure that is popular among economists today. You would think that uh, if there was any one issue that economists agreed on, Okay, if there, if you, if, obviously, everybody knows economists disagree on macroeconomic policy and things like that. But you, you, you would think that just about everyone would agree that minimum wage laws create unemployment, especially among teenage workers. This is kind of one thing. Just about all economists, mainstream economists, Austrian economists, of just about, economists of just about every stripe agreed that minimum wages cause unemployment among teenagers. Okay, if you set the wage higher than what the market wage would be, then some teenagers are going to be priced out of the market. No one will hire them because they don't generate 425 an hour worth of uh, worth of productivity. Well, this consensus was shattered a couple of years ago by a sensational publication by two Princeton economists named David Card and Alan Kruger. Kruger was actually the chief economist for the Department of Labor okay, before returning to Princeton. And they p began to circulate some research where they claimed to show that uh, Minimum wages actually, in, uh, the imposition of minimum wage, okay, especially left-wing economists nationwide were procl proclaiming, aha, here we, we finally have some evidence that price controls are good. Okay, they don't create, uh, uh, minimum wages don't create a surplus of labor. They don't create unemployment. They're good. We need higher minimum wages. Okay. Um, and even now, uh, some, some good economists stepped into the picture and, and showed that the Card and Kruger's study was it was a horrible, horrible study. Uh, uh, they based their numbers, that they called some fast food restaurants uh, to ask them about their employment practices. And whoever answered the phone, was, des was they wrote that down as the manager. And the manager reported that we hired this many people. Anyway, their, their, study was, it, their study was just awful. But I guess my point in bringing this up is that um, even with the collapse of socialism and the consensus that, well, pure, a pure planned economy isn't feasible, um, we're still a long ways from any sort of agreement on laissez-faire, okay, especially uh, among economists. Okay, all, the economists all have this kind of middle-of-the-road position, most of them. That, well, yeah, we have to have markets. You can't do away with markets. They're, they're, you've got to have them around. But there are market, you know, there's market failure lurking behind every tree. Okay, there's a, a QWERTY lurking behind that tree, and there's a... a some other kind of externality over there, and the, uh, we've got to have a strong central state to come in and combat these. Of course, th these people don't understand, and I'm sure have not read Mises' wonderful essay from 1950 called "Middle of the Road Leads to Socialism," and I think we have that on the on the table. We, uh, I know we've recently republished it along with another, along with Liberty and Property. Um, and, and Mises makes the the very important point that. These sort of middle of the road mixed economy solutions are not are not stable. Okay, it's not possible to have just one or two interventions, but 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 a free market the rest of the way, because every intervention introduces unintended consequences. Okay, minimum wages create unemployment, and so oh well, then we need another intervention to deal with the unemployment. We need uh, you know, unemployment relief. We need uh, a strong, stronger welfare state. Oh well, and that provides disincentives for people to enter the labor force in the first place. That causes another problem. Oh well, we need a new program to deal with that problem. Okay, so one intervention begats another intervention. Okay, and there's, it's, so if you have this kind of attempt to have this kind of mixture, it inevitably has to lead in one direction or another. In this case, it has to lead towards more and more intervention, okay, till we, till we end up at something that's more like pure socialism. Okay, very briefly, I want to tell you about uh, Murray Rothbard's, his approach to strategy. Okay, what can we do, and how is it different from uh, Hayek strategy? Okay. Well, Rothbard said uh, that the kind of strategy that Hayek advocated, that's what uh, Rothbard called that uh, education, uh, educationism, okay, the educationist strategy, where the goal is to try to persuade others. Okay, we try to persuade the intellectuals, uh, and then we try to persuade uh, uh, the, 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 the next lower level, and then eventually we try to persuade the masses. Show them that the ideas of liberty are true, correct, and just, Show them that this will bring about prosperity to all. Okay. Um, th th there's a, a problem, unfortunately, with this strategy. 
Okay. A, a couple problems with the, the pure, what Rothbard called the pure educationist strategy. Um, the first is that it takes a long time. Okay? It may be years and years, even hundreds of years, before we see any concrete results as the true ideas gradually trickle down. Okay? And some of us don't want to wait that long. Uh, another problem is that uh, you can't rely just on the intellectuals because the media have a huge influence. The media, of course, tend to ostracize any intellectuals who dissent from the prevailing mainstream wisdom. Can we see this around us all the time? Uh, uh, for, for example, there's a very eminent uh, epidemiologist at Berkeley named Peter Duisberg who's done some controversial research on AIDS. Uh, it's c completely sh shunned and shut out uh, by the media. Uh, Philip Johnson, the law professor at Berkeley who is, as, uh, is critical of Darwin's theory of evolution, um, is, is seen as portrayed as a right-wing religious kook uh, by the mainstream media. Uh, oh, and I, I can't, can't resist the, talking about the scholars who have done research in controversial areas such as IQ testing, the relationship between IQ and uh, socioeconomic performance and IQ and heredity. I don't know if any of you saw the article in this morning's San Francisco Chronicle about some conference on uh, IQ testing where there was a report that a new study showed that uh, giving, uh, if, if we focus our efforts on uh, babies, on young children, we can increase average IQ scores, but we've got to get the kids very early. Okay, there were some, uh, these, uh, a study tried to show that if you have massive, edu uh, you know, teaching and uh, mental drills, and I don't know exactly what they are, for children as, as early as, uh, but you have to get them before they're four months old. Okay, you have to begin this training in the very, in the first few months, and they had some, some study trying to show that a control group who had had this done to them uh, averaged, you know, so many points higher on IQ tests uh, years later. And so you can only imagine what, you know, what, what this implies, right, that, you know, just head start is, you know, that's way too late. That's not enough. We've got to have, you know, head start for newborns, okay? The, it takes a village. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It takes a village. But then the village has to begin educating the kids, you know, basically as soon as they come out of the womb. Um, the other problem with the pure educationist strategy um, is that intellectuals aren't always motivated just by the search for truth, Okay. Intellectuals and academics have their own agendas. Sometimes they want fame and fortune, and they uh, enjoy going to Washington and serving in a position of power. You can't rely exclusively on the intellectual class to bring about this revolution, okay? because they're, they're, they may not have purely altruistic motives. So education is key. Education is crucial, but it's not sufficient. It's not enough. Okay. Whoops. Um, Rothbard's strategy was what he called uh, right-wing populism, okay, right-wing populism, or right-wing radicalism, okay, meaning that we have to use both the educationalist strategy, both intellectual uh, educational means, but also we need to encourage uh, a rebellion, resentment among the people against the, the crimes committed by the, by the elites, by the regulators, and by the state. Okay? Um, Rothbard calls this, uh, he describes his right-wing populism as exciting, dynamic, tough, and confrontational, rousing and inspiring not only the exploited masses, but the often shell-shocked right-wing intellectual cadre as well. Okay? So how do we do this? What do we want? Well, we need, we need a cadre of intellectuals and academics on our side. Okay? And that's certainly, uh, we certainly need that for to achieve long-run change and also sort of medium-run change to attract students to, uh, to, to listen to our ideas, uh, to, to get young professors and so on, uh, to help develop and promote uh, the ideas of Austrian economics and, uh, and of liberty. But we also, need, uh, we also need journalists. We need grassroots activists. We need uh, uh, sort of popular agitator types. Okay, because we, because uh, Rothbard felt that deep down the masses really were on our side. And I think he's right. The uh, uh, sort of, you know, heartland folks uh, certainly do not, despite the way they're portrayed uh, in, in the media, okay, are, are definitely on our side. Right? These are the people that, uh, uh, I think it was Bill Kaufman who made the, 
drew this wonderful distinction between the people who run America and the people who live in America. Okay, so we're talking about the people who live in America, real Americans, not the Beltway insiders, not the, the bi-coastal cultural elite. Okay, but the people in the middle, what the elites refer to as uh, people who live in flyover country. Okay, you know, the Midwest, the South. Um, those people are on our side and we need to, we have to make sure that uh, we reach out to them. So Rothbard's strategy uh, was to try to, what we need to do uh, is try to mobilize uh, the radical and revolutionary sentiment expressed in the 94 elections that Lou, uh, Lou talked about last night. Um, so we need to educate the public. We need to educate businessmen. Uh, we need to educate students and academics, journalists and politicians. We need to put pressure on legislators. We need to expose them for what they really are. And we need to take back our language and not allow uh, uh, this, uh, uh, not allow them to change the terms uh, to, to take our words and twist them around, as, as, as Hayek uh, said back in the 1940s. Um, and how does the Mises Institute figure into this? Uh, well, we're, we're deeply committed to the same kind of strategy for change uh, that Murray Rothbard uh, outlined. Okay? So on the scholarly side, we're, we're committed to the Rothbardian program of sort of a broad interdisciplinary science of liberty, with an emphasis on Austrian economics, but uh, uh, but also uh, uh, attention to uh, political theory and philosophy, history, law, and so on. Okay, and we also uh, uh, have certainly have great journalists as part of part of the team. Okay, there's you can look at the list of the Mises Institute's media fellows. Find very just the, the, those few uh, uh, the. Just about everyone, every, every good member of the media is, is, is one of our group. Um, also, uh, we're, uh, uh, the Mises Institute, uh, we insist on being independent, okay? Uh, that we're not sort of corrupted by power. We don't go off to Washington like the Berkeley economists, okay, and roam the corridors of power whispering in the ears of the, of the great leaders and publishing opinion studies and working for the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund and the Federal Reserve Bank. Okay, the, the, uh, the Austrian economists and the Mises Institute economists don't do that. We're not interested in doing that. Okay, we, don't, we, we have, we have no, no desire to do that. Okay. So, so what is it that we can do? What can we expect, um, to, to achieve our goals? Okay, well, first of all, we, we can't rely on mainstream economists. Okay, and I've, as I've tried to make clear earlier, we can't rely on the mainstream economists to be on our side. Okay. What we have to do is train more Austrian economists. Okay, we need more young scholars to be promoting the Austrian school of economics. You know, I want to see a day where if you look at the, the list of adjunct scholars of the Mises Institute, you know, that will be a longer list than the, the list of members of the American Economic Association. Okay, then we'll know that we've got real progress, that we're really somewhere. Okay, we need to take back our language. We need to call, we need to use liberty to mean liberty and not twist it or not allow it to be twisted the way it has been. Um, and we certainly don't want to play nice. Okay, that was another part of Hayek's strategy. Hayek had a, Idea. You had to be very sort of genteel and very uh, stay strictly within the mainstream, and you don't say anything nasty about anybody. And I think this is a this is a flawed strategy. Okay, we need to expose the people for what they are. Don't call the socialists nice, uh, intelligent people who are a little bit misguided. Okay, call them wrong, call them false, call them monstrous, as Murray Rothbard would say. Um, Lou, for example, did this when Laura Tyson was first announced uh, as. Uh, Clinton's uh, appointee. Lou was one of the first in print to expose, uh, and it's very easy to do. You just quote from her previous writings, okay, her work on comparative economic systems, her praise of uh, the Ceausescu regime for the miraculous economic uh, wonders that it worked in Romania. Um, we need to show, show these people what they are. Okay, if we want prosperity, if we want real progress, then we need liberty. Okay, what we need is liberty. Um, and Hayek says in The Road to Serfdom, a policy of freedom for the individual is the only true progressive policy. Okay? And that, that is the road to prosperity. Thank you. <laughs>